There are, as everybody knows, two Americas, of which one is European. European America is chiefly the eastern states, where the older stocks look up respectfully to foreign aristocracies, and more recent immigrants look back with a certain nostalgia to the culture and traditions of their native lands. In this European America there is an active conflict between the Anglo-Saxon soul, sober and genteel, and the restless and innovating spirit of the newer peoples. The English code of thought and manners must eventually succumb to the continental cultures that encompass and inundate it here. But for the present, that British mood dominates the literature, though no longer the morals, of the American East. Our standard of art and taste in the Atlantic states is English, our literary heritage is English, and our philosophy, when we have time for any, is in the line of British thought. It is this New England that produced Washington and Irving and Emerson and even Poe. It is this New England that wrote the books of the first American philosopher, Jonathan Edwards. And it is this New England that captured and remade that strange, exotic figure, America's latest thinker, George Santayana. For Santayana, of course, is an American philosopher only by grace of geography. He is a European who, having been born in Spain, was transported to America in his unknowing childhood, and who now in his ripe age returns to Europe as to a paradise for which his years with us were a probation. Santayana is steeped in the genteel tradition of the old America. The other America is American. It consists of those people, whether Yankees or Hoosiers or cowboys, whose roots are in this soil and not in Europe whose manners, ideas, and ideals are a native formation, whose souls are touched neither with the gentility of the families that adorned Boston or New York or Philadelphia or Richmond, nor with the volatile passions of the Southern or Eastern European. Men and women molded into physical ruggedness and mental directness and simplicity by their primitive environment and tasks. This is the America that produced Lincoln, Thoreau, Whitman, and Twain. It is the America of horse sense, of practical men, of hard-headed businessmen. It is the America which so impressed itself upon William James that he became its exponent in philosophy, while his brother became more British than an Englishman. And it is the America that made John Dewey. We shall have, very probably, no more Santayanas, for hereafter it is America and not Europe, that will write America's philosophies. Santayana was born at Madrid in 1863 and died in Rome in 1952. He was brought to America in 1872 and remained here till 1912. He took his degrees at Harvard and taught there from his 27th to his 50th year. One of his students describes him vividly. Those who remember him in the classroom will remember him as a spirit solemn, sweet, and withdrawn, whose Johannine face by a Renaissance painter held an abstract eye and a hieratic smile, half mischief, half content, whose rich voice flowed evenly in cadences smooth and balanced as a liturgy, whose periods had the intricate perfection of a poem and the import of a prophecy, who spoke somehow for his hearers and not to them, stirring the depths in their natures and troubling their minds, as an oracle might, to whom pertained mystery and reverence, so compact of remoteness and fascination was he, so moving and so unmoved. He was not quite content with the country of his choice. His soul, softened with much learning and sensitive as a poet's soul must be, for he was a poet first and philosopher afterward, suffered from the noisy haste of American city life. Instinctively he shrank back to Boston, as if to be as near to Europe as he could, and from Boston to Cambridge and Harvard, and a privacy that preferred Plato and Aristotle to James and Royce. He smiled with a little bitterness at the popularity of his colleagues, and remained aloof from the crowd and the press, but he knew that he was fortunate to have found a home in the finest school of philosophy that any American university had ever known. It was a fresh morning in the life of reason, cloudy but brightening. His first essay in philosophy was The Sense of Beauty, 1896, which even the matter-of-fact Münsterberg rated as the best American contribution to aesthetics. Five years later came a more fragmentary and more readable volume, Interpretations of Poetry and Religion. Then for seven years, like Jacob's serving for his love, he worked silently, publishing only occasional verse. 
he was preparing his magnum opus, The Life of Reason. These five volumes, Reason in Common Sense, Reason in Society, Reason in Religion, Reason in Art, and Reason in Science, at once lifted Santayana to a fame whose quality fully atoned for what it lacked in spread. Here was the soul of a Spanish grandee grafted upon the stock of the gentle Emerson, a refined mixture of Mediterranean aristocracy with New England individualism, and above all a thoroughly emancipated soul, almost immune to the spirit of his age, speaking as if with the accent of some pagan scholar come from ancient Alexandria to view our little systems with unwondering and superior eye, and to dash our new old dreams with the calmest reasoning and the most perfect prose. Hardly since Plato had philosophy phrased itself so beautifully. Here were words full of a novel tang, phrases of delicate texture, perfumed with subtlety and barbed with satiric wit. The poet spoke in these luxuriant metaphors, the artist in these chiseled paragraphs. It was good to find a man who could feel at once the lure of beauty and the call of truth. After this effort, Santayana rested on his fame, contenting himself with poems and minor volumes. Then, strange to say, after he had left Harvard and gone to live in England, and the world presumed that he looked upon his work as finished, he published in 1923 a substantial volume on Skepticism and Animal Faith, with the blithe announcement that this was merely an introduction to a new system of philosophy, to be called Realms of Being. It was exhilarating to see a man of sixty sailing forth on distant voyages anew, and producing a book as vigorous in thought and as polished in style as any that he had written. We must begin with this latest product, because it is in truth the open door to all of Santayana's thinking. Skepticism and Animal Faith Here, says the preface, is one more system of philosophy. If the reader is tempted to smile, I can assure him that I smile with him. I am merely attempting to express for the reader the principles to which he appeals when he smiles. Santayana is modest enough, and this is strange in a philosopher, to believe that other systems than his own are possible. I do not ask anyone to think in my terms if he prefers others. Let him clean better, if he can, the windows of his soul, that the variety and beauty of the prospect may spread more brightly before him. In this last and introductory volume, he proposes to clear away, first of all, the epistemological cobwebs that have enmeshed and arrested the growth of modern philosophy. Before he delineates the life of reason, he is willing to discuss, with all the technical paraphernalia dear to the professional epistemologist, the origin, validity, and limits of human reason. He knows that the great snare of thought is the uncritical acceptance of traditional assumptions. Criticism surprises the soul in the arms of convention, he says unconventionally. He is willing to doubt almost everything. The world comes to us dripping with the qualities of the senses through which it has flowed, and the past comes down to us through a memory treacherously colored with desire. Only one thing seems certain to him, and that is the experience of the moment, this color, this form, this taste, this odor, this quality. These are the real world, and their perception constitutes the discovery of essence. Idealism is correct, but of no great consequence. It is true that we know the world only through our ideas, but since the world has behaved for some thousands of years substantially as if our combined sensations were true, we may accept this pragmatic sanction without worry for the future. Animal faith may be faith in a myth, but the myth is a good myth, since life is better than any syllogism. The fallacy of Hume lay in supposing that by discovering the origin of ideas he had destroyed their validity. A natural child meant for him an illegitimate one. His philosophy had not yet reached the wisdom of the French lady who asked if all children were not natural. This effort to be skeptically strict in doubting the veracity of experience has been carried by the Germans to the point of a disease, like a madman forever washing his hands to clean away dirt that is not there. But even these philosophers, who look for the foundations of the universe in their own minds— do not live as if they really believed that things cease to exist when not perceived. We are not asked to abolish our conception of the natural world, nor even in our daily life to cease to believe in it. We are to be idealists only north-northwest or transcendentally. When the wind is southerly, we are to remain realists. I should be ashamed to countenance opinions which, when not arguing, I did not believe. 
It would seem to me dishonest and cowardly to militate under other colors than those under which I live. Therefore no modern writer is altogether a philosopher in my eyes except Spinoza. I have frankly taken nature by the hand, accepting as a rule in my farthest speculation the animal faith I live by from day to day. And so Santayana is through with epistemology, and we breathe more easily as we pass on with him to that magnificent reconstruction of Plato and Aristotle, which he calls the life of reason. This epistemological introduction was apparently a necessary baptism for the new philosophy. It is a transitional concession. Philosophy still makes its bow in epistemological dress, like the labor leaders who for a time wear silk breeches at the king's court. Some day, when the Middle Ages are really over, philosophy will come down from these clouds and deal with the affairs of men. Reason in Science The life of reason is a name for all practical thought and action justified by its fruits in consciousness. Reason is no foe of the instincts, it is their successful unison. It is nature become conscious in us, illuminating its own path and goal. It is the happy marriage of two elements, impulse and ideation, which, if wholly divorced, would reduce man to a brute or a maniac. The rational animal is generated by the union of these two monsters. He is constituted by ideas which have ceased to be visionary and actions which have ceased to be vain. Reason is man's imitation of divinity. The life of reason bases itself frankly on science because science contains all trustworthy knowledge. Santayana knows the precariousness of reason and the fallibility of science. He accepts the modern analysis of scientific method as merely a shorthand description of regularities observed in our experience, rather than laws governing the world and guaranteed unchangeable. But even so modified, science must be our only reliance. Faith in the intellect is the only faith yet sanctioned by its fruits. So Santayana is resolved to understand life, feeling like Socrates, that life without discourse is unworthy of a man. He will subject all the phases of human progress, all the pageant of man's interests and history, to the scrutiny of reason. He is modest enough, nevertheless. He proposes no new philosophy, but only an application of old philosophies to our present life. He thinks the first philosophers were the best, and of them all he ranks highest Democritus and Aristotle. He likes the plain, blunt materialism of the first, and the unruffled sanity of the second. In Aristotle the conception of human nature is perfectly sound. Everything ideal has a natural basis, and everything natural an ideal development. His ethics, when thoroughly digested and weighed, will seem perfectly final. The life of reason finds there its classic explication. And so, armed with the atoms of Democritus and the golden mean of Aristotle, Santayana faces the problems of contemporary life. In natural philosophy I am a decided materialist, apparently the only one living, but I do not profess to know what matter is in itself. I wait for the men of science to tell me. But whatever matter may be, I call it matter boldly, as I call my acquaintances Smith and Jones without knowing their secrets. He will not permit himself the luxury of pantheism, which is merely a subterfuge for atheism. We add nothing to nature by calling it God. The word nature is poetical enough. It suggests sufficiently the generative and controlling function, the endless vitality and changeful order of the world in which I live. To be forever clinging to the old beliefs in these refined and denatured forms is to be like Don Quixote, tinkering with obsolete armor. Yet Santayana is poet enough to know that a world quite divested of deity is a cold and uncomfortable home. Why has man's conscience in the end invariably rebelled against naturalism and reverted in some form or other to a cultus of the unseen? Perhaps because the soul is akin to the eternal and ideal. It is not content with that which is, and yearns for a better life. It is saddened by the thought of death, and clings to the hope of some power that may make it permanent amid the surrounding flux. But Santayana concludes bluntly, I believe there is nothing immortal. No doubt the spirit and energy of the world is what is acting in us, as the sea is what rises in every little wave, but it passes through us, and, cry out as we may, it will move on. 
Our privilege is to have perceived it as it moved. Mechanism is probably universal, and though physics cannot account for that minute motion and pollulation in the earth's crust of which human affairs are a portion, the best method in psychology is to suppose that mechanism prevails even in the inmost recesses of the soul. Psychology graduates from literature into science only when it seeks the mechanical and material basis of every mental event. Even the splendid work of Spinoza on the passions is merely literary psychology, a dialectic of deduction, since it does not seek for each impulse and emotion its physiological and mechanical ground. The behaviorists of today have found the right road and should follow it unfrightened. So thoroughly mechanical and material is life that consciousness, which is not a thing but a condition and a process, has no causal efficacy. The efficacy lies in the heat with which impulse and desire move brain and body, not in the light which flashes up as thought. The value of thought is ideal, not causal. That is, it is not the instrument of action, but the theater of pictured experience and the recipient of moral and aesthetic delights. Is it the mind that controls the bewildered body and points out the way to physical habits uncertain of their affinities? Or is it not much rather an automatic inward machinery that executes the marvelous work, while the mind catches here and there some glimpse of the operation, now with delight and adhesion, now with impotent rebellion? Lalande, or whoever it was, who searched the heavens with his telescope and could find no god, would not have found the human mind if he had searched the brain with a microscope. Belief in such a spirit is simply belief in magic. The only facts observed by the psychologist are physical facts. The soul is only a fine, quick organization within the material animal, a prodigious network of nerves and tissues growing in each generation out of a seed. Must we accept this buoyant materialism? It is astounding that so subtle a thinker and so ethereal a poet as Santayana should tie to his neck the millstone of a philosophy which, after centuries of effort, is as helpless as ever to explain the growth of a flower or the laughter of a child. It may be true that the conception of the world as a bisectable hybrid, half material and half mental, is the clumsy conjunction of an automation with a ghost, but it is logic and lucidity personified alongside of Santayana's conception of himself as an automaton automatically reflecting on its own automatism. And if consciousness has no efficacy, why was it evolved so slowly and so painfully? And why does it survive in a world in which useless things so soon succumb? Consciousness is an organ of judgment as well as a vehicle of delight. Its vital function is the rehearsal of response and the coordination of reaction. It is because of it that we are men. Perhaps the flower and its seed and the child and its laughter contain more of the mystery of the universe than any machine that ever was on land or sea. And perhaps it is wiser to interpret nature in terms of life rather than try to understand her in terms of death. But Santayana has read Bergson, too, and turns away from him in scorn. Bergson talks a great deal about life. He feels that he has penetrated deeply into its nature. And yet death, together with birth, is the natural analysis of what life is. What is this creative purpose that must wait for sun and rain to set in motion? What is this life that in any individual can be suddenly extinguished by a bullet? What is this élan vital that a little fall in temperature would banish altogether from the universe? Reason in Religion Saint Beuve remarked of his countrymen that they would continue to be Catholics long after they had ceased to be Christians. This is the analysis of Renan and Anatole France, and of Santayana too. He loves Catholicism as one may still long for the woman who has deceived him. I do believe her, though I know she lies. He mourns for his lost faith, that splendid error which conforms better to the impulses of the soul than life itself. He describes himself at Oxford in the midst of some ancient ritual. Exile that I am, exile not only from the wind-swept moor, where Guadarana lifts his purple crest, but from the spirit's realm, celestial sure, goal of all hope and vision of the best. It is because of this secret love, this believing unbelief, that Santayana achieves his masterpiece in Reason in Religion, filling his skeptical pages with a tender sadness, and finding in the beauty of Catholicism plentiful cause for loving it still. 
He smiles, it is true, at the traditional orthodoxy, the belief, namely, that the universe exists and is good for the sake of man or of the human spirit. But he scorns the enlightenment common to young wits and worm-eaten old satirists who plume themselves on detecting the scientific ineptitude of religion, something which the blindest half see, but leave unexplored the habits of thought from which those tenets sprang, their original meaning and their true function. Here, after all, is a remarkable phenomenon, that men everywhere have had religions. How can we understand man if we do not understand religion? Such studies would bring the skeptic face to face with the mystery and pathos of mortal existence. They would make him understand why religion is so profoundly moving, and in a sense so profoundly just. Santayana thinks with Lucretius that it was fear which first made the gods. Faith in the supernatural is a desperate wager made by man at the lowest ebb of his fortunes. It is as far as possible from being the source of that normal vitality which subsequently, if his fortunes mend, he may gradually recover. If all went well, we should attribute it only to ourselves. The first things which a man learns to distinguish and repeat are things with a will of their own, things which resist his casual demands. And so the first sentiment with which he confronts reality is a certain animosity, which becomes cruelty toward the weak, and fear and fawning before the powerful. It is pathetic to observe how lowly are the motives that religion, even the highest, attributes to the deity, and from what a hard-pressed and bitter existence they have been drawn. To be given the best morsel, to be remembered, to be praised, to be obeyed blindly and punctiliously. These have been thought points of honor with the gods, for which they would dispense favors and punishments on the most exorbitant scale. Add to fear, imagination. Man is an incorrigible animist, and interprets all things anthropomorphically. He personifies and dramatizes nature, and fills it with a cloud of deities. The rainbow is taken for a trace left in the sky by the passage of some beautiful and elusive goddess. Not that people quite literally believe these splendid myths, but the poetry of them helps men to bear the prose of life. This mythopoetic tendency is weak today, and science has led to a violent and suspicious reaction against imagination. But in primitive peoples, and particularly in the Near East, it was unchecked. The Old Testament abounds in poetry and metaphor. The Jews who composed it did not take their own figures literally. But when European peoples, more literal and less imaginative, mistook these poems for science, our Occidental theology was born. Christianity was at first a combination of Greek theology with Jewish morality. It was an unstable combination, in which one or the other element would eventually yield. In Catholicism, the Greek and pagan element triumphed. In Protestantism, the stern Hebraic moral code. The one had a renaissance, the other a reformation. The Germans, the northern barbarians, Santa Anna calls them, had never really accepted Roman Christianity. A non-Christian ethics of valor and honor, a non-Christian fund of superstition, legend, and sentiment, subsisted always among medieval peoples. The Gothic cathedrals were barbaric, not Roman. The warlike temper of the Teutons raised its head above the peacefulness of the Oriental, and changed Christianity from a religion of brotherly love to a stern inculcation of business virtues, from a religion of poverty to a religion of prosperity and power. It was this youthful religion, profound, barbaric, poetical, that the Teutonic races insinuated into Christianity, and substituted for that last sigh of two expiring worlds. Nothing would be so beautiful as Christianity, Santayana thinks, if it were not taken literally, but the Germans insisted on taking it literally. The dissolution of Christian orthodoxy in Germany was thereafter inevitable. For taken literally, nothing could be so absurd as some of the ancient dogmas, like the damnation of innocence, or the existence of evil in a world created by omnipotent benevolence. The principle of individual interpretation led naturally to a wild growth of sects among the people, and to a mild pantheism among the elite, pantheism being nothing more than naturalism poetically expressed. Lessing and Goethe, Carlyle and Emerson, were the landmarks of this change. In brief, the moral system of Jesus had destroyed that militaristic Yahweh, who by an impish accident of history had been transmitted to Christianity along with the pacifism of the prophets and of Christ. 
Santayana is by constitution and heredity incapable of sympathy with Protestantism. He prefers the color and incense of his youthful faith. He scolds the Protestants for abandoning the pretty legends of medievaldom, and above all for neglecting the Virgin Mary, whom he considers, as Heine did, the fairest flower of poesy. As a wit has put it, Santayana believes that there is no God, and that Mary is his mother. He adorns his room with pictures of the Virgin and the saints. He likes the beauty of Catholicism more than the truth of any other faith, for the same reason that he prefers art to industry. There are two stages in the criticism of myths. The first treats them angrily as superstitions. The second treats them smilingly as poetry. Religion is human experience interpreted by human imagination. The idea that religion contains a literal, not a symbolic representation of truth and life, is simply an impossible idea. Whoever entertains it has not come within the region of profitable philosophizing on that subject. Matters of religion should never be matters of controversy. We seek rather to honor the piety and understand the poetry embodied in these fables. The man of culture, then, will leave undisturbed the myths that so comfort and inspire the life of the people, and perhaps he will a little envy them their hope but he will have no faith in another life. The fact of having been born is a bad augury for immortality. The only immortality that will interest him is that which Spinoza describes. He who lives in the ideal, says Santayana, and leaves it expressed in society or in art, enjoys a double immortality. The Eternal has absorbed him while he lived, and when he is dead his influence brings others to the same absorption, making them, through that ideal identity with the best in him, reincarnations and perennial seats of all in him which he could rationally hope to rescue from destruction. He can say, without any subterfuge or desire to delude himself, that he shall not wholly die, for he will have a better notion than the vulgar of what constitutes his being. By becoming the spectator and confessor of his own death and of universal mutation, he will have identified himself with what is spiritual in all spirits and masterful in all apprehension. And so conceiving himself, he may truly feel and know that he is eternal. Reason in Society The great problem of philosophy is to devise a means whereby men may be persuaded to virtue without the stimulus of supernatural hopes and fears. Theoretically, it solved this problem twice. Both in Socrates and in Spinoza, it gave the world a sufficiently perfect system of natural or rational ethics. If men could be molded to either philosophy, all would be well. But a truly rational morality or social regimen has never existed in the world and is hardly to be looked for. It remains the luxury of philosophers. A philosopher has a haven in himself, of which I suspect the fabled bliss to follow in other lives is only a poetic symbol. He has pleasure in truth and an equal readiness to enjoy the scene or quit it though one may observe a certain obstinate longevity in him. For the rest of us, the avenue of moral development must lie, in the future as in the past, in the growth of those social emotions which bloom in the generous atmosphere of love and the home. It is true, as Schopenhauer argued, that love is a deception practiced upon the individual by the race, that nine-tenths of the cause of love are in the lover, for one-tenth that may be in the object and that love fuses the soul again into the impersonal blind flux. Nevertheless, love has its recompenses, and in his greatest sacrifice man finds his happiest fulfillment. Laplace is reported to have said on his deathbed that science was mere trifling, and that nothing was real but love. After all, romantic love, despite its poetical delusions, ends normally in a relationship of parent and child, far more satisfying to the instincts than any celibate security. Children are immortality, and we commit the blotted manuscript of our lives more willingly to the flames when we find the immortal text half engrossed in a fairer copy. The family is the avenue of human perpetuity, and therefore still the basic institution among men. It could carry on the race even if all other institutions failed. But it can conduct civilization only to a certain simple pitch— Further development demands a larger and more complex system in which the family ceases to be the productive unit, loses its control over the economic relations of its members, and finds its authority and its powers more and more appropriated by the state. 
The state may be a monster, as Nietzsche called it, a monster of unnecessary size, but its centralized tyranny has the virtue of abolishing the miscellaneous and innumerable petty tyrannies by which life was of old pestered and confined. One master pirate, accepting tribute quietly, is better than a hundred pirates, taking toll without warning and without stint. Hence, in part, the patriotism of the people. They know that the price they pay for government is cheaper than the cost of chaos. Santayana wonders whether such patriotism does more harm than good, for it tends to attach the stigma of disloyalty to advocates of change. To love one's country, unless that love is quite blind and lazy, must involve a distinction between the country's actual condition and its inherent ideal, and this distinction in turn involves a demand for changes and for effort. On the other hand, race patriotism is indispensable. Some races are obviously superior to others. A more thorough adjustment to the conditions of existence has given their spirit, victory, scope, and a relative stability. Hence, intermarriage is perilous, except between races of acknowledged equality and stability. The Jews, the Greeks, the Romans, the English, were never so great as when they confronted other nations, reacting against them and at the same time perhaps adopting their culture. But this greatness fails inwardly whenever contact leads to amalgamation. The great evil of the state is its tendency to become an engine of war, a hostile fist shaken in the face of a supposedly inferior world. Santayana thinks that no people has ever won a war. Where parties and governments are bad, as they are in most ages and countries, it makes practically no difference to a community, apart from local ravages, whether its own army or the enemy's is victorious in war. The private citizen, in any event, continues in such countries to pay a maximum of taxes, and to suffer, in all his private interests, a maximum of vexation and neglect. Nevertheless, the oppressed subject will glow like the rest with patriotic ardor, and will decry as dead to duty and honor any one who points out how perverse is this helpless allegiance to a government representing no public interest. This is strong language for a philosopher, but let us have our Santiana unexpurgated. Often enough, he thinks, conquest and absorption by a larger state is a step forward toward the organization and pacification of mankind. It would be a boon to all the world if all the world were ruled by some great power or group of powers, as all the world was once ruled by Rome, first with the sword and then with the word. The universal order once dreamt of and nominally almost established, the empire of universal peace, all permeating rational art and philosophical worship, is mentioned no more. Those dark ages from which our political practice is derived— had a political theory we should do well to study, for their theory about a universal empire and a Catholic church was in turn the echo of a former age of reason when a few men conscious of ruling the world had for a moment sought to survey it as a whole and to rule it justly. Perhaps the development of international sports may give some outlet to the spirit of group rivalry and serve in some measure as a moral equivalent for war and perhaps the cross-investments of finance may overcome the tendency of trade to come to blows for the markets of the world. Santayana is not so enamored of industry as Spencer was. He knows its militant as well as its pacific side, and all in all he feels more at ease in the atmosphere of an ancient aristocracy than in the hum of a modern metropolis. We produce too much and are swamped with the things we make. Things are in the saddle and ride mankind, as Emerson put it. In a world composed entirely of philosophers, an hour or two a day of manual labor, a very welcome quality, would provide for material wants. England is wiser than the United States, for though she too is obsessed with the mania for production, she has in at least a portion of her people realized the value and the arts of leisure. He thinks that such culture as the world has known has always been the fruit of aristocracies. Civilization has hitherto consisted in the diffusion and dilution of habits arising in privileged centers. It has not sprung from the people, it has arisen in their midst by a variation from them, and it has afterward imposed itself on them from above. A state composed exclusively of such workers and peasants as make up the bulk of modern nations would be an utterly barbarous state. Every liberal tradition would perish in it, and the rational and historic essence of patriotism itself would be lost. The emotion of it, no doubt, would endure, for it is not generosity that the people lack. 
They possess every impulse. It is experience that they cannot gather, for in gathering it they would be constituting those higher organs that make up an aristocratic society. He dislikes the ideal of equality and argues with Plato that the equality of unequals is inequality. Nevertheless, he does not quite sell himself to aristocracy. He knows that history has tried it and found its virtues very well balanced by its defects, that it closes career to unpedigreed talent, that it chokes the growth in all but a narrow line of just those superiorities and values that aristocracy would in theory develop and use. It makes for culture, but also it makes for tyranny. The slavery of millions pays for the liberty of a few. The first principle of politics should be that a society is to be judged by the measure in which it enhances the life and capacities of its constituent individuals. But for the excellence of the typical single life, no nation deserves to be remembered more than the sands of the sea. From this point of view, democracy is a great improvement on aristocracy. But it too has its evils, not merely its corruption and its incompetence, but worse, its own peculiar tyranny, the fetish of uniformity. There is no tyranny so hateful as a vulgar anonymous tyranny. It is all permeating, all thwarting. It blasts every budding novelty and sprig of genius with its omnipresent and fierce stupidity. What Santayana despises above all is the chaos and indecent haste of modern life. He wonders was there not more happiness for men in the old aristocratic doctrine that the good is not liberty, but wisdom, and contentment with one's natural restrictions. The classical tradition knew that only a few can win. But now that democracy has opened the great free-for-all, catch-as-catch-can wrestling match of laissez-faire industrialism, every soul is torn with climbing and no one knows content. Classes war against one another without restraint, and whoever is victorious in this struggle, for which liberalism cleared the field, will make an end of liberalism. This is the nemesis of revolutions, too, that in order to survive they must restore the tyranny which they destroyed. Revolutions are ambiguous things. Their success is generally proportionate to their power of adaptation and to the reabsorption within them of what they have rebelled against. A thousand reforms have left the world as corrupt as ever, for each successful reform has founded a new institution, and this institution has bred its new and congenial abuses. What form of society, then, shall we strive for? Perhaps for none. There is not much difference among them. But if for any one in particular, for timocracy. This would be government by men of merit and honor. It would be an aristocracy, but not hereditary. Every man and woman would have an open road, according to ability, to the highest offices in the state. But the road would be closed to incompetence, no matter how richly furnished it might be with plebiscites. The only equality subsisting would be equality of opportunity. Under such a government, corruption would be at a minimum, and science and the arts would flourish through discriminating encouragement. It would be just that synthesis of democracy and aristocracy which the world pines for in the midst of its political chaos today. Only the best would rule, but every man would have an equal chance to make himself worthy to be numbered among the best. It is, of course, Plato over again, the philosopher-kings of the Republic appearing inevitably on the horizon of every far-seeing political philosophy. The longer we think about these matters, the more surely we return to Plato. We need no new philosophy. We need only the courage to live up to the oldest and the best. Comment There is in all these pages something of the melancholy of a man separated from all that he loves and was accustomed to, a man déraciné, a Spanish aristocrat exiled to middle-class America. A secret sadness sometimes breaks forth. That life is worth living, he says, is the most necessary of assumptions, and, were it not assumed, the most impossible of conclusions. In the first volume of The Life of Reason, he talks of the plot and meaning of human life and history as the subject of philosophy. In the last volume he wonders, is there a meaning or a plot? He has unconsciously described his own tragedy. There is tragedy in perfection because the universe in which perfection arises is itself imperfect. Like Shelley, Santayana has never felt at home on this middling planet. His keen aesthetic sense seems to have brought to him more suffering from the ugliness of things than delight in the scattered loveliness of the world. He becomes at times bitter and sarcastic. He has never caught the hearty cleansing laughter of paganism, 
nor the genial and forgiving humanity of Renan or Anatole France. He stands aloof and superior, and therefore alone. What is the part of wisdom, he asks, and answers, to dream with one eye open, to be detached from the world without being hostile to it, to welcome fugitive beauties and pity fugitive sufferings, without forgetting for a moment how fugitive they are. But perhaps this constant memento mori is a knell to joy. To live, one must remember life more than death. One must embrace the immediate and actual thing as well as the distant and perfect hope. The goal of speculative thinking is none other than to live as much as may be in the eternal and to absorb and be absorbed in the truth. But this is to take philosophy more seriously than even philosophy deserves to be taken. And a philosophy which withdraws one from life is as much awry as any celestial superstition in which the eye, wrapped in some vision of another world, loses the meat and wine of this one. Wisdom comes by disillusionment, says Santayana. But again, that is only the beginning of wisdom, as doubt is the beginning of philosophy. It is not also the end and fulfillment. The end is happiness, and philosophy is only a means. If we take it as an end, we become like the Hindu mystic whose life purpose is to concentrate upon his navel. Perhaps Santayana's conception of the universe as merely a material mechanism has something to do with this somber withdrawal into himself. Having taken life out of the world, he seeks for it in his own bosom. He protests that it is not so, and though we may not believe him, his too much protesting disarms us with its beauty. A theory is not an unemotional thing. If music can be full of passion, merely by giving form to a single sense, how much more beauty or terror may not a vision be pregnant with, which brings order and method into everything that we know? If you are in the habit of believing in special providences, or of expecting to continue your romantic adventures in a second life, materialism will dash your hopes most unpleasantly, and you may think for a year or two that you have nothing left to live for. But a thorough materialist, one born to the faith and not half plunged into it by an unexpected christening in cold water, will be like the superb Democritus, a laughing philosopher. His delight in a mechanism that can fall into so many marvelous and beautiful shapes, and can generate so many exciting passions, should be of the same intellectual quality as that which the visitor feels in a museum of natural history, where he views the myriad butterflies in their cases, the flamingos and shellfish, the mammoths and gorillas. Doubtless there were pangs in that incalculable life, but they were soon over. And how splendid meantime was the pageant, how infinitely interesting the universal interplay, and how foolish and inevitable those absolute little passions. But perhaps the butterflies, if they could speak, would remind us that a museum, like a materialist philosophy, is only a showcase of lifeless things, that the reality of the world eludes these tragic preservations, and resides again in the pangs of passion, in the ever-changing and never-ending flow of life. Santayana, says an observant friend, had a natural preference for solitude. I remember leaning over the railing of an ocean liner anchored at Southampton and watching passengers from the English tender crowd up the gangplank to the steamer. One only stood apart at the edge of the tender, with calm and amused detachment observed the haste and struggle of his fellow passengers, and not till the deck had been cleared followed himself. Who could it be but Santayana, a voice said beside me, and we all felt the satisfaction of finding a character true to himself. After all, we must say just that, too, of his philosophy. It is a voracious and fearless self-expression. Here a mature and subtle, though not too somber, soul has written itself down quietly in statuesque and classic prose. And though we may not like its minor key, its undertone of sweet regret for a vanished world, we see in it the finished expression of this dying and nascent age, in which men cannot be altogether wise and free, because they have abandoned their old ideas and have not yet found the new ones that shall lure them nearer to perfection.